Hello, everyone. Greetings and welcome to the Power of State Government, a fireside chat between Wisconsin Attorney General Josh Call uh, and Public Rights Project founder Jill Habig. I'm Kristen Jansen, Marketing Communications Manager here at Public Rights Project, and I just wanted to welcome and thank you all for joining us today. This welcome also comes from 60 plus of our government office partners and 100 fellows who are in dozens of cities across the country helping us redefine enforcement. If you haven't done so already, please introduce yourself via the chat box and let us know how you would finish the prompt I am attending today to ensure. Um, I see we have a few already. We have Samuel who said, I am attending today because I'm fascinated by the work progressive AGs are doing across the country. Glad to be here. Thanks for putting this event on. Let's see, we have one from Zoe. Uh, hello, my name is Zoe and I'm a 1L at UC Hastings. I'm attending today to ensure abortion remains a healthcare option for all. Snaps to that. So now I'd like to introduce you to our moderator of this chat, Peer Peace founder and president, Jill Habig. Jill is an attorney and political strategist with experience in political campaigns, policy advocacy, affirmative litigation, and public law. She has been named an Ashoka Fellow, Open Society Foundation's Leadership and Government Fellow, a Draper Richards Kaplan Social Entrepreneur for her work building public rights project, and most recently an Emerson Collective Dial Fellow. So please help me bring out to our virtual stage, Jill Habig. Thank you, Kristen. Really excited to be here this morning. I'm Jill Habig. I'm the founder and president of Public Rights Project. And this is an especially exciting conversation for me because before I founded PRP, I spent several years in the California Attorney General's office working for a little known attorney general named Kamala Harris. So um, I know very well as a former you know, advisor in an attorney general's office, what the day-to-day -day challenges and opportunities and just the tremendous power that our state attorneys general have to protect people's legal rights. And I'm really excited to talk to one of the most exciting, I think, uh, attorneys general across the country, Wisconsin Attorney General Josh Call. Uh, before I bring him on, I just want to give a quick background about Public Rights Project for those of you who might be less familiar. Our reason for being is really to close the gap between the promise of our laws and the actual lived reality of communities that have been underserved and marginalized. So we work with state and local governments across the country, like the Wisconsin Attorney General's office, to help them use legal power that they already have to protect communities' civil rights, but that they may not have the capacity or the resources internally to fully utilize that power and service of their communities. So we do that in a variety of ways, one of which you'll hear about today is our fellowship program to help infuse talent into our state AG's offices as well as our city attorney's offices across the country. We also do other trainings, technical assistance, and communication uh, support for offices across the country. And uh, the Wisconsin Attorney General's Office is one of over 60 offices that we partner with across the country. Uh, we're in about 24 states, so if you go to the next slide, you can see our map across the country if you're interested in seeing where we are and we are expanding every year so we're really excited to be growing our footprint and growing our network of dynamic elected officials and public service lawyers across the country so with that i will move to the main event our fireside chat with attorney general josh call let me give you a brief introduction if you're not familiar with him josh call was sworn in as wisconsin's 45th attorney general in 2019 he has a background in voting rights and, of course, public safety. And his goals were to reinvigorate the office's work on a number of issues, from revitalizing the enforcement of Wisconsin's consumer protection and environmental laws to launching new fair housing cases in addition to the, his core public safety docket. Previously, before becoming attorney general, uh, Josh Call was a federal prosecutor in Baltimore. Uh, he graduated from Yale and majored in history and economics with honors and went to Stanford Law School, where he served as president of the Stanford Law Review. So, Attorney General Call, welcome. Thanks for having me, Jill. It's great to be with you. Excellent. Thanks for joining. So, let's dive right in. Help us set the stage of what it was like when you were first taking office just a couple of years ago. What were the challenges you were facing and what were your first priorities? There are two things I think are really important to note about that. Um, one is 
Uh, you know, I was replacing the the prior incumbent. We had run against each other in the 2018 election, and uh, there was going to be a real policy shift in terms of uh, what we were prioritizing and where our resources uh, were going to be going. There had been AGs from a different party uh, for 12 years prior to me, and you know, one of the things that I saw as really important to do in the office was to develop a lot of our our public protection work, uh, our work uh, enforcing environmental laws, enforcing consumer laws, enforcing uh, civil rights laws to the extent that we had that authority. So we knew that we wanted to make sure that we were prioritizing those issues in a way that they hadn't been previously. Now that sounds great in theory. The problem is we also were walking into a very difficult budget situation. Uh, the, our legislature before I took office and our, our new governor took office passed legislation that limited our authority in various ways, but it, it also impacted our budget uh, in a way that really limited what resources we, we had available. So we both uh, knew what areas we wanted to work to strengthen the office in, uh, but needed to do it in the constraints of a, a difficult budget environment. Well, that sounds exactly like the kind of problem that Public Rights Project exists to, to help offices with. So this is exactly the, the kind of leadership that we love to support at PRP. But from your perspective, like what was what was appealing about partnering with, with Public Rights Project? What were the skills and resources that you felt like you needed more of in your office? Yeah, so one of the things we needed to do to address that that issue was to uh, actually just hire people to do the work of our environmental enforcement, our consumer protection work. But again, with, with limited resources, that creates challenges. Um, we were able to do some of that, you know, on our own. And, you know, just as an example, our environmental protection unit had gotten down to three people, three lawyers in the prior administration. And uh, you know, we have a, an agency that's focused on environmental cases, our Department of Natural Resources. But when it's a really serious case or there needs to be a, a court action brought or it's a flagrant repeat violator, that's when the Department of Justice in our state gets involved. But, but with only three lawyers, it's hard to do that in, in a lot of cases. So one of the things we did is reorganized. We uh, merged our consumer protection and our environmental protection units to reduce the number of supervisors, so there would just be one person overseeing both of those units. It also allowed us to combine our uh, paralegals and our legal uh, assistants. But through the Public Rights Project, we were able to add an additional attorney as well. And you know, when you're talking about the the scale that that we're talking about here, we I think we have a little over ten lawyers in in that unit between the environmental work and the consumer work. And so, you know, adding another lawyer really uh, meaningfully increases our our capacity to to do that work. Now. One other thing I'll add, which frankly we had not uh, realized was going to be such a benefit, is the recruitment process that PRP helps us with. Uh, you know, we get great applicants um, for for lots of our positions, but we were really fortunate in the the PRP application process to get um, really outstanding applicants. Uh, you know, the person we ended up um, offering the fellowship to, who, who joined us, Colin Stroud, had worked at the U.S. Department of Justice previously, so. We were able to bring somebody in who had great experience and was able to, to hit the ground running. That's great. You talk about small offices. We often work with offices that have just one or two attorneys in a unit. We always joke that, you know, when we're bringing a fellow into a unit with one attorney, we're doubling the size of the unit. So, but with 10 lawyers, that's still, that's still a big change to add, add a lawyer that, that adds a lot of capacity. Um, so you talked about Colin, our wonderful fellow who's now just completed his fellowship in the office. Uh, I think we have a clip actually of Colin back from our 2019 orientation, just to give folks a little bit of background about him and, his goal for the fellowship at the time. So do you wanna cue up that video? I am Colin Stroud and I am excited to call Madison, Wisconsin my home. On any given day, you can find me working at the Wisconsin Department of Justice. I work to enforce equity by helping folks have their voices be heard. I was doing this work, but on the federal level, enforcing civil rights statutes throughout the country. And so people had a sense of that work. So when framing this job, I really focused on the fact that this was gonna be in Wisconsin, which is this place that I grew up. And in my memory has this really strong, proud tradition of protecting the environment, of protecting workers, and really engaging the community to solve problems through its government. I 
I think a theme that has come out a lot is listening and being intentional about seeking folks out to hear from them about what problems they're experiencing. And it's not going to be one set of problems. I think folks are going to be confronted with a variety of challenges and trying to think about how those things are related and how the offices that we work for might have tools that can start to get at some of those problems and really try to be responsive to what's going on. I think that's the beauty of these jobs is that they are local in a sense, that they are meant to be tied more closely to the communities that we're serving. And I think that gives you a good opportunity to really get to understand the situation day to day for the people that we're working for. I've had a long journey getting from graduating from high school in Madison, living in Colorado, Chicago, New York, DC, and now coming back. And I'm excited to bring that perspective back to the place where I'm from. And I think one thing that PRP has to offer is that energy and perspective, bringing that to bear on issues that are happening in Wisconsin. And so I'm excited to be tapped into other fellows, other people working in this field, bringing their ideas and their enthusiasm for the work because, you know, it can feel like a slog sometimes that there's a lot to do and it piles up and it's good to see other people are out there, they're exhausted, but they're showing up every day. And I think that that helps to, to know that that's happening and get that routine inspiration. You know, I think uh, Colin really hit on some of the, the really important work that, that AG's offices do. Like I said, we've been lucky to have him as a, a member of our team at DOJ. And I, I have to say also, as a proud Wisconsinite, it was great to get uh, some of those beautiful pictures from Wisconsin in there. I'm not going to use this yeah. as an uh, encouragement for people to apply for jobs at the Wisconsin Department of Justice. But of course, we are uh, <laughs> always happy to have folks uh, helping us out in Wisconsin. From your perspective um, with Colin over the last couple of years, you know, how did the fellowship go? What what wins did the fellowship have? And also, you know, where were there some bumps in the road? Well, I, I think it was really great. You know, first, as I mentioned, we had just expanded our capacity to do a lot of the work that, that really makes an impact in people's lives in our states. I mean, if you think about our consumer protection work, for example, uh, when somebody has been defrauded, whether it's from a predatory for-profit college or in a number of other ways, getting a relief that allows people to get a debt relief or to get money back that they were fraudulently induced into spending, that can make an enormous difference in, in somebody's life. Uh, now, one of the things that uh, Colin ended up doing was really developing an area that had sat dormant in our office for a while. As I mentioned, we wanted to do more work to protect the public. And one of the areas where we wanted to do more was on civil rights enforcement issues. Unfortunately, Wisconsin is one of about half of the states where the AG's office has pretty limited authority in that respect. But while it's limited, it's not the case that we don't have any authority. We do have Fair Housing Act uh, enforcement authority under our state fair housing law, which is similar to the, the federal law. That authority hadn't been used for, for over a decade in the state. So we were really starting from scratch. And with Colin coming in, um, he worked to develop that into an area that we are now uh, involved in enforcing the laws again in the state. So, you know, just to give you a, a few examples, uh, in one case, um, you know, we, we were able to get a consent judgment, uh, which is basically an in-court settlement uh, that provided injunctive relief, as well as uh, a little over $17,000 to a complainant who had alleged um, race discrimination and retaliation. In another case, a, a settlement agreement provided over $16,000 uh, to a complainant who alleged that uh, she had been discriminated against because of a disability. In one civil suit, we were able to uh, obtain an order that barred somebody from being evicted while our Department of Workforce Development, which is another state agency, uh, investigated and resolved the discrimination complaint that it had received. Uh, and then another one was a, a civil suit where a circuit court uh, entered an order that, again, barred eviction uh, while a discrimination investigation was going on. The way that our system is set up, it allows private actors to bring those kinds of cases, but in a typical case, somebody's not going to be able to hire a lawyer, pay for the enforcement action, and, and ultimately get the judgment they're hoping for. And so having our State Department of Justice able to bring those kinds of actions helps make our anti-discrimination provisions and our housing laws effective for people. Now, the other thing, as I mentioned before, was we're, we're one of the states that doesn't have as broad uh, civil rights enforcement authority as, as a number of states do. So Colin worked 
to draft proposed legislation, which was introduced earlier this year in our state legislature, that would give our office uh, that broad authority. Now, it, it hasn't gone anywhere yet, but our goal is to really lay the groundwork so that in the future, when we are able to move forward with, uh, with that legislation, we're able to get enough legislators on board uh, that we will be able to give uh, you know, a future attorney general or a future DOJ that kind of enforcement authority. So that, that's one really big area. You know, I know there are a few mm-hmm. others that we're going to talk about as well, and, and I'll just sort of mention uh, you know, protecting people's voting rights, um, protecting people's health during the pandemic are other areas where Colin was able to have a direct impact through his work as a PRP fellow. That's wonderful. And I I want to just read for folks, because when you were launching some of the fair housing cases and announcing some of those settlements, which is just, you know, sixteen or $17,000 to someone who's in danger of losing their home is a lifeline. That is just a profound impact on their lives. Um, and so when you were announcing these cases, you said something that really just kind of perfectly encapsulates why Public Rights Project exists. So I just wanted to read it for folks. You said, after years in which prior administrations didn't use the authority that Wisconsin DOJ has to enforce fair housing protections, we are once again enforcing those laws. So just thank you so much for your work on that front. You know, one other question I have around fair housing and other cases, one of the things we found from a number of offices we work with is that especially at the state level, sometimes there can be a tendency for the office to be pretty removed from the community and then therefore not really hear or be able to connect with community members who are having problems like housing discrimination and other things that really affect their lives. Did you find that this kind of work connected your office to the community in a new way? So I think there are two really important impacts from from this kind of work. And and certainly housing discrimination is, is a really important example, but enforcing our, our environmental laws and bringing community stakeholders together, or enforcing consumer laws and getting relief for people also helps with this. Um, one is that there clearly are strained relationships in some places between uh, communities and people who are, are law enforcers. And one of the things that benefits, I believe, both communities and those who are, are in law enforcement is showing that the law is working for people and that it is being even-handedly enforced and that uh, you know, a landlord who is breaking the law is held accountable just as somebody else who who breaks the law. And so working to show that we are delivering for all people in our state, whether it's through the, the fair housing cases we brought or fighting for, for civil rights enforcement authority, it also helps us when we work to strengthen public safety by working to, you know, build stronger community ties so that um, we can lift communities up. A second area where I think it it really makes a difference is, you know, there's a lot of cynicism about government right now, and you know that's probably not unique to this this period in history. But uh, you know, we see a lot of gridlock in Congress. We see it in our state legislature. When we're really making a difference in people's lives with these cases, it shows how government can work and how it can be effective, uh, and why it's important to have these protections in place. Because it's one thing to pass the laws and have them on the books, but unless they're actually enforced, they're not making a difference in in people's lives. When we can make that difference, we can show why an office like an AG's office is important and and why it's important to bring the kind of values to that office that that we do of uh, making sure we're protecting the public. Yeah, thank you for that. That's so important. And so speaking of people's trust, (laughs) trust in government and, and faith in government, you know, one of the biggest challenges your office faced uh, in recent years was the 2020 elections. And, you know, Colin and, and many other lawyers in your office helped defend the integrity of those elections in court. So as a former voting rights lawyer yourself, can you talk about that work and why it was so important for your office to protect Wisconsinites' right to vote? Yeah, well, uh, you know, it's funny. I, um, I, as you mentioned, I did voting rights litigation um, before I was attorney general, and I worked on cases challenging laws that that made it harder for people to vote. And you know, one of the things that I, I thought was going to happen as attorney general is that I would spend less time than I had focused on voting rights issues. It's not usually sort of a central feature of of the work that AGs do, but uh, obviously that was not the case. Uh, certainly in 2020, and now continuing into 2021, you know, everybody knows how important Wisconsin is in the the national political landscape. And there were a number of uh, cases going on before the election. There was an effort, for example, to purge uh, tens of thousands of voters from our our voter rolls. 
there was this slowdown with the mail and we were one of the states that challenged uh, what the Postal Service was doing when you know, a lot of voters were going to be casting absentee ballots. We were concerned about election day and, and security of voters uh, when they went to the polls and voter intimidation. So we were very clear that that's something we took seriously and that people would be held accountable if they engaged in, in voter intimidation. But then after the election, there was a concerted effort to overturn the results of, of the election in Wisconsin, really to steal Wisconsin's presidential vote. And um, fortunately, we had uh, teams that worked to protect uh, the will of the voters. We had recounts in our two largest counties that confirmed the results. We had several different legal actions going on. And Colin was, was one of the lawyers who was part of our team protecting uh, the will of the voters. And, um, you know, people, I think when they think about going to law school and, and having an impact through the work they do as, as lawyers, you know, protecting our democracy and upholding uh, the will of the voters in a presidential election is I think about as, as much as anybody could ask for uh, when it comes to having an impact. And because Colin had become such an integral part of our team, he was part of that effort. But, well, yes, you're right. It doesn't get much more fundamental than that. So um, I have a couple more questions for you and then we can open up to Q&A. So I just want to give a note to folks, if you're thinking about a question, please go ahead and enter it in the Q&A box and we'll get to it in a few minutes. But so now that some, at least some of that election work is behind you, uh, and you you did the basic, you know, the work of protecting people's right to vote. What's what's next for your office? What are your top priorities that you're looking forward to in the next few years? Yeah, there's there's certainly a lot of things that um, we have coming up, but you know, just to keep on the theme of voting issues, 2020 election is mostly behind us. Although we have a what's being called an investigation um, by our legislature that's happening right now, we're, we're involved in that issue. But we're also in the midst of our redistricting process. And, you know, Wisconsin, unfortunately, had extremely gerrymandered maps for, um, for nearly a decade now. And, you know, our office is representing our, our governor in advocating for uh, nonpartisan maps, fair maps that will empower voters. Uh, and that's going to be litigated over the next several months. You know, there's always the possibility that there will be legislation that passed that passes and is signed into law, but I don't think anybody thinks that that is very likely to happen. And so it's likely going to be uh, our courts that that resolve that issue. Another big issue uh, is is public safety. My, my top priority as attorney general is, is public safety. And with the pandemic, we've seen a really tragic uh, spike in, in shootings and in homicides around the country, including in communities in, in Wisconsin. And uh, responding to that in a way that is going to make our communities safer and that's going to do so in a way that is equitable and just and that will build stronger communities in the long run uh, is something that's a, a priority of mine. You know, one of the things we're, we're working on uh, that relates to that issue is the opioid epidemic. We filed suit against Purdue Pharma early in my administration and we're, we joined investigations into opioid distributors, multi-state investigations. We're now in line to start resolving some of those major cases. And, you know, we look like we're going to be bringing over $400 million to the state to help make communities in Wisconsin safer and, and to help them with their, their fight against the, the epidemic. And that's going to make an enormous difference um, in people's lives. Um, another big priority of mine has been working to strengthen our response to, to sexual assault. Uh, there had been a backlog of thousands of, of untested kits in our state. We've been advocating for legislation that would help prevent a future backlog from happening. But we've also been working on investigating cases where there were DNA uh, matches and where there was foreign DNA identified so that people are, are finally held accountable, sometimes, unfortunately, many years um, after the fact. Uh, and then uh, protecting environment, our environment and consumers also remains a huge issue. We, you know, During the Trump administration, we had a lot of litigation against the federal government, trying to push back against rollbacks to people's rights, rollbacks to protections for our climate. Now we're playing much more of a role where we try to offer suggestions. Um, we seem to get more positive reception from, from agencies like the EPA now. And so on uh, PFAS, for example, uh, these toxic forever mm. chemicals that have impacted communities in our state and, and around the country, we've been a leader in, in several multi-state letters advocating for, for stronger protections uh, so that we're protecting clean water. So those are, those are a few of the issues. There are certainly others we're working on, but there's certainly no shortage of important issues 
that AG's offices have a really incredible opportunity to uh, make progress on. Yeah, thank you for that. So, you know, just in the last 20 minutes or so, we've covered the environment, voting, consumers, housing, toxic chemicals, et cetera. I think this gives people a flavor of just the scope of, of work that you have in front of you and that so many of our government partners are, are facing. So, you know, we have some of our government partners on with us. What kind of advice would you have for other governments in our network, those who may be starting a partnership with PRP or considering one, people who are, you know, offices that are trying to do new and innovative things? I'll say a couple of things on that. One is, you know, the, the experience of working with PRP and having a PRP fellow has been entirely positive for our office. You know, I think we were lucky to get great applicants and to uh, hire a great fellow. Uh, Colin is now has been hired as a permanent uh, DOJ employee. Those extra resources, you know, it, I, I know you're in the California AG's office and I, I think you, there are over a thousand lawyers there. So one lawyer may not uh, make a critical yeah. difference, but in a smaller office or even a midsize office, we're probably midsize, uh, you know, having uh, those extra resources makes a difference, particularly when you're thinking about the unit level where you've got, you know, environmental or consumer enforcement and the, the groups are much smaller. So it's been really helpful to us. It's also a great way to uh, identify people and, and help develop skills so that if they apply for a job, uh, permanent position, um, they've had a chance to see what the office is like, see the areas that they're interested in. And, and our uh, folks have had the chance to see what kind of work that they do. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's a great opportunity for all sorts of different government agencies, whether it's a AG's office or a DA's office or a city attorney or, or what have you. That's great. Um, thank you for that. And then th we also have a number of attorneys on who are early in their careers. I think you mentioned earlier there was someone who is a 1L at UC Hastings. Uh, I know we have several of our fellows who just started uh, this fall a month or so ago. You know, what advice do you have for attorneys early in their careers who are thinking about public service? Yeah, there, there are a few things I guess I would pass along. One is I encourage everybody who is interested in public service to get involved. It is an incredible opportunity to have an impact um, in your community, in your state, and, and in the country. For that reason alone, it's, it's a really worthwhile thing to do and to get involved with. The other thing that's great about public service as an attorney is if you want to get litigation experience and if you want to do impact litigation, you, you've got to have litigation experience. Uh, you know, there's there's really no better place to do it than than in the government. Um, I spent part of my career at at large law firms. I also spent part of my career as an assistant U.S. attorney in Baltimore. I had, was fortunate to have different experiences and to to get a lot of litigation experience, both as an AUSA and then uh, doing voting rights litigation. That kind of experience is invaluable as you're working on cases and thinking about how to resolve them, um, how to work together, and how to advise um, agencies and you know, the best way to do that is uh, through public service. The other thing I think is really helpful to lawyers is doing something that you care about, where, where the work that you're doing is, is something you're passionate about. If you're doing that, you're going to, you know, be a lot more likely to look forward to the litigation you're having, to get invested in the work. And, and you're ultimately, I think, going to do a better job if it's something where you've got a real passion for the work that you're doing. Um, you know, we've all heard from, from lawyers who discourage people from going to law school and, and, you know, don't uh, advise people to become lawyers. But, you know, I think if you're in an area where you care about it, uh, you have a real opportunity to uh, not only make an impact, but to do something you love. And, and the last thing I'll say, and this is somewhat um, unusual about AG's offices, I don't think people think about it. And it's probably equally true for DA's offices or city attorneys on the local level. But, you know, we've had a real opportunity, not only to put, you know, to bring enforcement actions, but also to uh, put policy ideas relating to legal issues on the agenda uh, with our legislature. And so I, I mentioned a good example before, which is the draft of the Civil Rights Enforcement Authority bill that, that Colin worked on. You know, AG's offices and, and mm -hmm. DA's offices and other offices have a lot of expertise and developing relationships with legislators and then being able to uh, propose ideas is, uh, I think, a, you know, a really important part of the job that I think people don't think about as much when they're thinking about litigators and, and agencies that litigate, but it really gives you an opportunity to have a big impact on policy, even if you're working in a litigation capacity. 
Yeah, that, that is a great point. I think people don't realize how much policy influence uh, a public law office can have. So that's a really good point. Uh, so we're about to open up the floor. We have a couple of great questions already and feel free to add yours. But I just want to thank you, Attorney General Call, for, for your time and just for partnering with us over the last two years. It's been such a pleasure. I also just want to thank all of our government partners, community organizations, funders, advocates that have just been part of this effort over the last couple of years. And just want to encourage folks again to subscribe to our newsletter at publicrightsproject.org and, and follow our online magazine, The Public, on Medium. So, okay, we have a couple great questions. One is, do you have any examples you could talk about uh, with uh, about collaboration with other government entities, like municipalities, federal agencies, just any insights you have about leveraging r their respective strengths and, and managing expectations as you build those relationships? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I, I really enjoy about um, the work that we do at, at the State Department of Justice is that we collaborate with different agencies in, in a whole host of different ways. And giving just one example is, is tricky because there, there are so many and it's so integral to our work. But as an example, there are certainly uh, enforcement actions where we partner with the federal government. There may be both state law violations and, and federal law violations, uh, you know, and we, we work together uh, in that capacity. We also, you know, provide guidance to municipalities. I, one of the areas we um, haven't talked about much that, that Colin worked on was, I believe Colin worked on this. Uh, he can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but uh, are some of the coronavirus cases and protecting public health. And there, that's an area where we ultimately issued guidance uh, to our municipal governments. Our, our state Supreme Court struck down our state uh, rules that had been in place. And we wanted to make sure that local governments knew uh, what authority that they they had, you know, we of course worked with different uh, law enforcement agencies uh, around our state, and we work with state government agencies. You know, some of the fair housing cases I was mentioning are ones where our Department of Workforce Development uh, would do sort of the initial review and investigation, but when they thought it would be important to get our office involved in the case, they, they would reach out to us. And, and then on the policy issues, bringing together you know, a broad group of, of stakeholders can be really helpful in, in moving policy solutions forward. So those are a few examples, but there are, are many of them. That's great. Thank you. Um, another question is, just want your input on how activists can best inform and even influence, you know, the decisions that an AG's office makes and whether it's what cases to take or just what to prioritize in terms of policy or enforcement or even just your use of the bully pulpit, you know, do you you can call the media, you can um, have, you know, microphones in front of you, unlike many members of the public. This is from the perspective of someone who's a philanthropist and, uh, you know, active in, in advocacy efforts. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things that is unusual about an AG's office as compared to, say, a legislator is, you know, you, you certainly don't want your enforcement functions to be improperly influenced in any way. And so that's something that we very carefully think about and, and make sure we're conducting in a way that is impartial and that we're promoting the rule of law through the work that we do. On the other hand, we're, we're not judges. Um, you know, we are making decisions about where to put resources and, and having input from the public can be extremely valuable, both in, in identifying issues, but also in, in getting a sense of what are priorities when it comes to our resources? What should they be? And I'll, I'll give you a couple examples of things that I found really useful. Um, so we, what we try to do is uh, meet with people who have issues they want to raise that are relevant to uh, our office. And we try to do it in a way where we're getting lots of points of view and lots of input from people. Uh, you know, I've certainly met with people whose, whose views on issues I don't necessarily agree with, because I think that that's, you know, an important part of the job is to hear different perspectives. About one meeting I had that uh, is one that, that sticks with me was with some uh, environmental activists. And one of the things they talked about was our resolution of an environmental case uh, uh, where there had been a, a manure spill in the part of the state where they lived. And, you know, they said, well, it was sort of a process where we didn't really have a, a feeling of ownership. We didn't know what was going on because there was this case brought, there was resolution for a certain amount. And, you know, we didn't have any input. We didn't know what it was going to be. And now, of course, you know, those decisions do need to be made ultimately by the AG's office as to what the resolution should be. But, you know, one thing I took away from that meeting was in figuring out how to resolve a case, having a sense of what's going to be most important to the community, to people who are impacted, 
is really valuable. And we took that lesson and in a different case uh, was referred to our office from the DNR. It's an ongoing matter, but it involved um, PFAS contamination. We had a public uh, forum where we heard from people. I took questions. I heard from people about what was important to them, what their concerns were. And it was really helpful to hear from people about you know, what it is that would make the biggest difference in their community in terms of a potential resolution because of the health concerns that people had, because of the harms uh, to the environment. Uh, and then when you're doing these sort of public law litigations, just, just knowing you know, what impacts these things are having can, can help you make your case stronger. So, you know, meeting with AGs is something I encourage folks to do if there are issues that are of importance. That's sort of on the enforcement side, but then on the public side, the advocacy side, uh, AGs do have a, a bully pulpit and can advocate on issues that are important to them. And we've advocated for, for legislation in a variety of ways. Um, one of my priorities, which I mentioned before, is working to put legislation in place that will help prevent a future backlog of untested sexual assault kits and you know, that's one where we got input from a lot of different uh, folks who had different perspectives on that issue, victim advocates from our, our crime lab staff, from, from prosecutors and from others. And that really helped us shape proposed legislation that was stronger as a result. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think um, when you were, you're talking about reaching out to community members and hearing from community members, I think so often, especially from the AG's office perspective, if you're trying, if you're in that position like you were in of trying to reinvigorate portions of the office that haven't been as active in recent years, people don't necessarily even know that you're the right office to, to come to for those issues. We, we have that a lot in California. I started a children's civil rights division and we met with a number of child advocates across the state. That said, wait a minute, we're, you're the agency we sue, but you're not the agency we partner with. <laughs> and so it took us a while to, you know, build up those relationships, but that's, that's, that's really important. So we have one other good question, which is, how did you, you know, locate or seek out the housing discrimination complainants? Did they report the issue directly to your office or did your team work with local organizations? The way that our enforcement structure works in, in the state for a lot of um, civil enforcement actions is that there is usually a particular state agency, which is not us, that is tasked with uh, sort of intake of complaints from people or, or other concerns that they have. So just to take a different context that I was talking about before, the uh, with environmental violations, we have a Department of Natural Resources. And in sort of the run-of-the-mill case, you know, it would normally, it would go to that agency first. And even in, in most significant cases, it goes to that agency first. And when it becomes a, a matter that either may go to litigation uh, or where they, they want to bring some an additional attorney or some additional legal background into the process, that's usually where our office gets involved. And there are a couple of things we've done to, to sort of increase our, our ability to do that. One is we sort of looked uh, at what our authority is precisely internally. You know, I, in some areas like consumer and environmental protection, it was being done before, just not as uh, vigorously as I, I thought was appropriate. And so in that respect, it's, it's easy. There are already sort of mechanisms in place. In the housing cases, on the other hand, first, we were talking with our, the head of our division of legal services. You know, one of the things she said that she thought was important for us to do, she knew what our priorities were at a high level, is, is housing discrimination cases. She said, this is an area where we have authority. It hasn't been used. So we ultimately ended up uh, developing this sort of sub-practice within our public protection unit. Uh, and then, of course, you know, um, having relationships developed between our attorneys and the agencies that do that work so that they know we're interested in it and they know to refer cases to us uh, ultimately helps lead to those cases. But it, it takes time. It takes a while before you, those agencies get a sense of which types of cases ought to involve uh, our office. But it's really important, and by, by laying that groundwork, hopefully that we've built something that will be in place, not only during my tenure as AG, but, but beyond. Yeah, that's a really important point. I think until you work in government, I think people often assume that relationships between agencies are automatic and they're so much more people-based <laughs> than we might otherwise assume. Uh, we definitely had agencies that hadn't heard from us in a while uh, or, or weren't used to collaborating in the way that we were seeking to do so. So um, that's really important. All right, so I will, are there any other questions people have? You have a minute to 
put in your your questions in the box. We can talk about NBA basketball. Uh, <laughs> I have my Steph Curry jersey back here. You know, we're coming for your champion bucks. <laughs> I don't well, know if you want to comment on that. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, uh, I, I certainly wish, uh, wish you guys luck, but I, we feel really good about, uh, the bucks and, uh, they've been, um, underestimated in the past. And I, I think they may be again this year. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the season ahead, but you know, if you also, if you want to talk about last night's football game with the Packers, uh, we're, we're, I'm certainly happy to talk <laughs> about the, the last, uh, second interception there as well. Excellent. Yeah, we have some we have some fandom happening in the chat box, which is great. Um, I'm just biding. We're just biding our time until Clay Thompson comes back, and then I, 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 we're, we're coming. I, I can say, you know, my my kids are seven and four, and um, as far as they know, every team in Wisconsin is just about always good in sports. And so, uh, you know, the Brewers <laughs> made the playoffs this year. Uh, you know, the Bucks are the champions, and the Packers are seven and one. So. You know, they, they haven't quite lived through some of uh, the, the ups and downs of uh, sports fandom, but but it's a it's a good time to be a Wisconsin sports fan. It really, it really is. And it's, I mean, it's hard to root against Giannis. I will do it if I have to, but I'm much more comfortable rooting against the Lakers. Well, thank you so much, Attorney General Call, for your time. We really appreciate you sharing all of the great work that you're doing in Wisconsin. And I will turn it over to Kristen to close us out. Thanks again for attending uh, the Power of State Government Fireside Chat between Wisconsin Attorney General Josh Call and Public Rights Founder Jill Habig. Thank you both. This was very informative, very productive, and we had a lot of good questions, a lot of interaction in the chat box. Yeah, and until next time, we hope you have a great weekend and be safe this Halloween. Thank you, everyone.